Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's Explorer Classroom event. My name is Joe Gorowski from National Geographic, and I'll be your host for today. Really excited for today's event. We always love um, when we get an opportunity to take virtual field trips and see really neat and exciting things. And today's virtual field trip is going to be a lot of fun here on Explorer Classroom. Now, before I introduce the event, I want to take a quick moment uh, and give a shout out to all the classrooms who are starting to tune in with us live via YouTube. Don't forget that you can still get on the action. There's a chat sidebar on the right. Uh, let us know where you're watching from, send us in some questions and we'll work those into the session. And as always, we love to see pictures of classrooms in action. So if you're on YouTube, if you're joining us live in a camera spot, uh, please feel free to take some pictures, post them to Twitter, uh, hashtag uh, Explore Classroom and tag at Nacho Education. We've got a great group of classrooms joining us from all across North America, Canada and the United States. Uh, for today's virtual field trip, we are heading to the Pro Museum. Uh, we are so excited to be connecting with uh, Becca Pexado. We love doing this event because we get to see something pretty special, something that's visiting North America for the first time. So the Rising Star Cave System in South Africa, there was an amazing discovery of a ton of human uh, fossil elements. So over 1,500, in fact, and still more uh, being made. This turns out to be one of our undiscovered uh, human ancestors, Homo naledi. And since then, uh, we've been able to do events live from underground to see uh, people like Becca working and excavating these amazing pieces of our human history in real time. And now these fossils have been collected and they're gonna be spending several months in North America at the museum on display for the first time ever. So each month we've been visiting with Becca and we've been having a little tour around the human origins uh, exhibit. It's quite an amazing exhibit. It's amazing to have the opportunity to see these pieces of our human history. And it's even more exciting to talk to Becca, who spent countless hours underground in tough and challenging uh, conditions uh, to excavate and to preserve and to bring these fossils to the surface for us to see and enjoy. So Becca, it's so amazing to have you joining us live today. We're really excited to check out some of the exhibit. Great, thanks. thanks. Um, hello to everybody. Um, I am an archaeologist and right now I'm working at a museum. I do sometimes work, well a lot of times I work underground in a cave. Sometimes I work in a swamp or other, other kinds of places where there's archaeological things to find. And as an archaeologist I'm really interested in our human history and being able to work with these hominin fossils, these fossils of our ancient ancestors, um, I'm, I'm part of a team that is studying the history of all humans. So these are fossils that represent our ancient ancestors. We don't know if they were, you know, sort of our, our direct ancestors or if they're like ancient cousins. We're still trying to figure that out. And that's one of the exciting things about paleoanthropology, studying these, these old humans, um, is that there's so many questions left for us to answer. Uh, so we are in the Perot Museum of Nature and Science in Dallas, Texas, and we are here before the museum is open. So you're getting a sneak peek behind the scenes tour of the exhibit. Um, and this exhibit is a um, pretty special thing. Fossils like the ones that are behind me don't normally travel outside of the, their country of origin. And in this case, it's South Africa. So the fact that the government of South Africa and the University of Witwatersrand in Johannesburg um, we're willing to work with us here at the museum to let these fossils come so people could see them in, in person and so you all could see them on the uh, through through events like this is really special. So um, the friend that's right behind me here is called Australopithecus sediba and sediba is two million years old. Um, and this particular fossil, this, these bones that are right here behind me, the first one of them was discovered by a boy who was nine years old at the time. His name is Matthew Berger. Now he's, now he's almost done with college, so it's been quite a while ago. Um, but he was about nine at the time when he first saw a bone sticking out of a piece of rock in a place called Malapa in South Africa. Uh, and the story gets even even crazier here. I'll move you a little closer so you can see Sadiba a little bit better. Hopefully that's in focus for you. The story gets a little bit crazier because not only was Matthew nine and discovering a whole new hominin species, but it turns out that this particular individual was also between sort of equivalent to old when it when he died. So that's kind of a neat neat joiner that a nine year old found a two million year old nine year old. Um, and so Sadiba, as you can see, hopefully you can see, 
Uh, you can see that there's bone and then there's some brown stuff sticking around from the bone. And that brown stuff is all rock. It's called breccia. So the Sediba fossils are found in a really similar kind of setting that you might find dinosaur fossils where the bones are stuck into rock. All right? can you, hopefully you can see some of these bones here. This is a big block of breccia with, uh, with lots of bones sticking out of it. There's a scapula, so a shoulder blade, and the curved ones, hopefully you can see them, the curved ones are ribs, and there's lots of other bits and pieces of, a, of Australopithecus sediba in there. And to prepare these fossils, this is a whole different ball game. You have to um, use very special tools to chip the rock away from these bones. Uh, and it takes a long time. It took almost two and a half years to make this rock look like this with all these bones, to find all the bones in there. And people are still working on it. So in this exhibit, I'll show you a little bit more of Sediba here. Hopefully I'm not making you nauseous by moving you around too much. Um, you can see that we have, we have Sediba's skull there at, the, at one side and then lots and lots of, uh, there we go. Maybe, there we go. There you can see lots of his bones, his spine and his ribs, his pelvis and his legs. And they look pretty similar to our bones if you were to look at an x-ray of your own skeleton. But there are some differences that help us know that this particular skeleton was not a homo sapiens like us, but was, um, was an Australopithecus sediba, something that's very ancient and similar to us in many ways, but also quite different. So let's see, I'm gonna take you on a little tour of the rest of the exhibit. I'll try to go slowly and not walk into anything. So right behind me, you can see a whole bunch of skulls on the, on the wall. Those are all pictures of skulls. And these are all different ancient human relatives that we've found fossils from. So, um, that's not just that we have Australopithecus sediba, and maybe you've heard of Lucy, who was an Australopithecus afarensis. She's pretty famous. And Homo naledi, like Joe mentioned. But there's loads and loads of other species that we've found fossils for all over the world that represent where we come from and, um, as a species, as Homo sapiens. And the part of this that I'm most involved in as an archaeologist is the Homo naledi project in the Rising Star Cave. Let's see, that picture right behind me is what it looks like as you start to enter the cave. It's a big, um, it's, a, it's a really large entrance, but it doesn't stay like that for very long. See, we'll go this way. You can see on that mural behind me, hopefully, some of the kinds of animals that would have lived on the landscape around the cave when Homo naledi was alive. And he was alive about 300,000 years ago. But one of the tricks about this is that we find these fossils way, way down inside a cave. And that cave is super small. In fact, it's only about 18 centimeters, or for those of you in the US, about uh, seven and a half inches wide, and I'm going to try to squeeze my head back here. That's about how wide the space is that we have to go through to get into the cave. Can you see my face is getting squished? Definitely a tight squeeze. Something like that into, to get to work every day. All right, so uh, let's see. What else can I tell you about Homo naledi? Oh, so I told you that Australopithecus sediba was found stuck in rock. Homo naledi is really different, which is good for me as an archaeologist, because he's found just in dirt, in sediment, like we'd find anything else at an archaeological site. This bit of the exhibit's a little tricky to walk backwards through. Sorry if I bump into anything. Going faster. This is a little bit what it's like to go through the cave to find, to find Homo naledi. You gotta sort of find your way through a maze. And then here we are, there are the bones of Homo naledi. So that, that's a 300,000 year old ancestor uh, or ancient relative. And these are the ones that we find deep down in the cave. Um, and we think that Homo naledi was deliberately putting their dead fellows in that cave. 
which is kind of an interesting thing because humans, humans do that. But Homo naledi, as you can see right here, here's his reconstruction. Oop, there he is. Homo naledi is clearly not just like us, but he's kind of similar to us. This is an artist's reconstruction based on the bones there. So that's sort of the quick overview. Um, what else can I tell you? Do you have questions? Yeah, Becca, I was thinking, um, I queued up a little video uh, from Nat Geo okay. um, that shows uh, the six of you kind of in the cave and discovering Naledi. So I thought it might be a neat little piece to show the students so they can get a little perspective of the conditions you were working in. It's hard to show uh, from the exhibit. Yeah, exactly. That's great. All right. So I'm going to share the screen. Maybe I'll play about two minutes of it. And Becca's in the video and some of the other colleagues who she worked with in the Rising Star Cave System. So give me just a moment to share my screen. I'm going to play that little video because it's pretty cool. So here we go. Six remarkable young scientists squeeze through a 12 meter crawl down a chute 18 centimeters wide to get these fossils of a new species of early human ancestors, Homo naledi. It's really unusual to see all women scientists in these kinds of situations where you are expected to enter into and work within what might be considered a fairly risky or dangerous situation. Ordinarily, it's the men jumping at these things, but I think because of the size limitations on getting down into the site, women were given more of a chance to sort of get their foot in the door. <laughs> Hello, command center. This is Maria at the top of the chute. I'm just about to descend. Thank you. Bye. You start by descending down fairly narrow shaft and some tunnels. You have to crawl on your stomach for about three meters. Then you enter into another chamber. This is what we call the dragon's back with the four or five meter drop on either side. At the top of the chute, you start the 12 meter descent into the chamber. You then go through another passageway into the main fossil chamber. The first thing that came through my mind when I went through the final slot was Howard Carter opening Tutankhamun's tomb and Lord Carnarvon saying, what do you see? And Carter says things, wonderful things. Wow. Oh, this piece is beautiful. There is no find like this anywhere else. This is extraordinary on every level. It's almost hard to put into words what this is going to mean for this story that we tell ourselves about where we came from. We're really after this story. This is what excites us. It's not entirely clear at this point how it got there. They're so unusual. It doesn't seem to fit any currently known paradigm for fossil hominins. Unfortunately, the level of CO2 within this particular chamber of the cave system has spiked to a critical point. So we need to leave so that we're not all suffocating. <laughs> we need to get to the surface. CO2's up to 1,300. Those first couple of days were probably some of the hardest, most difficult days of their life physically because I was scared to leave people down there for too long. I was trying to rotate them out, which forced them to climb in and out, this torturous path. And they, of course, were like horses chomping at the bit to get in there and you know, we're ready to get out and ready to go back in. Have a blast, huh? To be All right, so I'm gonna bring us back. I think that gives a nice little uh perspective of your commute becca it's a little bit different some people complain about traffic but your commute is a little bit different when you're in the field it is a little bit different it's you know um so i'm based in texas and in order to get to the cave i've got to be on an airplane for at least 26 hours just to get to south africa but then when i get there the commute is fantastic it's really fun to go crawling through the cave and and to work with all the different members of the team you know, our team is about 150 scientists all over the world, and there's only a handful of us that actually go underground. A lot of the other people um, study these fossils, and they study the rocks and the sediment and other things about the cave system. 
um, in, in labs. Uh, so we work with geologists and, um, and people who specialize in different parts of the body and all kinds of people with different specialties, including artists to help us do the reconstructions like I showed you a few minutes ago. So it's a really cool team to be a part of. All right, very cool. Well, I think it's time that we meet some of our live classrooms. So I do want to take this moment just to do a quick shout out to our YouTube classrooms. I know we've got some tuning in. Uh, let us know where you're watching from. Uh, send us in some questions and we'll work those in. In fact, I'm going to say a quick hello to Mrs. Hilburn's uh, group joining us, sixth graders from Colorado Springs. So thanks for joining us. Send in some questions for us and let's uh, get going with some of our live classrooms. So we're going to get started in Florida. Uh, Mrs. Minkle's got a group of grade fives hanging out with us. So let's get that microphone turned on. How are we doing, fifth graders? Hi. All right, nice big group of fifth graders. Who's got a question for us? Go ahead, Bernie. Um, have you ever found, like, has she ever found um, dinosaur bones on accident? Uh, I have not. The question was, have I ever found dinosaur bones on accident? I have never found dinosaur bones on accident. Some of my colleagues might have, but um, but no, I haven't. Often in archaeology, the um, the dinosaur bones are found at different levels of the soil, maybe deeper or in totally different places than where we're finding the evidence of past humans. So um, not too often I've found found dinosaur bones at all, even. All right. Let's see. Let's jump to Canada. We're going to visit some fourth graders joining us uh, with Mrs. Sheffield. Let me see if I can find their mic. How are we doing, fourth graders? Hi. All right. Who's got a question? Okay. How do you test the bones to discover how old they are? The question is, how do we test the bones to discover how old they are? Um, well, there's two different things we ask about the age of the bones. The first one is how old was this was the individual when they died? How, how are the bones adult bones or are they kid bones? And the other question we ask is how long ago was the individual alive? So how old are those bones? And for the first question, whether the individual was a juvenile, a kid, or an adult or an old adult or a little baby, sometimes we can look at their teeth to help us figure that out. Sometimes we can look at how well developed their bones are. You know, um, most of you that are watching um, probably don't have all of your bones completely fused together because you're still growing. And so if we looked at your skeleton, we could see that. And we can see that, for example, in the sediva. Um, and then to figure out how long ago they lived, that gets a little trickier. Sometimes we can examine the teeth uh, and do some very specialized testing on the teeth to look at um, when the tooth was last exposed to natural radiation, for example, and that can tell us how long ago the, the uh, individual was alive. But we might also look at some of the rocks and the sediment around the bones to help us um, figure out, you know, this rock, the, the bones are sitting on top of this part of the cave, and we know this part of the cave is uh, a certain age, so the bones must be younger than that. So we use a lot of different clues to figure out how long ago the individuals were alive. All right, good question and definitely a challenging puzzle, but I'm sure it's fun uh, to try and work things like that out. Let's see, give another shout out. We've got a group joining us uh, from New Jersey. Looks like Mrs. Uh, Rybacki's class, but I'm gonna grab a question from our group in Colorado. And they're wondering, um, now, you mentioned being an archaeologist. Have you ever found uh, any artifacts to go along with some of the fossil finds? Uh, we are looking. We would really love to find some artifacts to go along with these fossil finds, some stone tools or something, but we haven't found any yet. One of the reasons we really want to find something is when we look at the hands of Homo naledi, we can see that their hands have the, have the right kind of features in the bones that they would have been able to potentially make and certainly use tools. They could do nice precision grips and have good strength. So we think that they sh that potentially there should be some stone tools around. We just haven't found any in the cave with the bones yet. But it's pretty interesting that above the cave on the surface, out in the open, there are some stone tools. 
And we used to think that all those stone tools had to have been made by Homo sapiens. But it turns out Homo naledi is about 300,000 years old. Some of those stone tools date to about 300,000 years old. So it lets us ask some questions we don't have answers to yet, like maybe Homo naledi was using those tools and how would we figure that out? Okay, uh, let's go to Thunder Bay, Ontario. Some grade sixes hanging out with Mrs. Uh, Levin. Let me see if I can get their microphone turned on for them. There it is. How are we doing Thunder Bay? Hmm. Microphone's not cooperating. So you could type the questions or I know sometimes you join on a second uh, device, but I'm gonna come back to your class um, with a question. So we know they're there, we know they can hear us, but we'll come back. Mrs. Hugs Group, Guelph, Ontario, fifth graders. Let me get their mic on. How are we doing Guelph? The coolest, what's the coolest find I've ever found? Well, um, I think in the Rising Star Cave, hands down the coolest thing I've ever found was a hand. And it was almost all of the bones, there's 26 bones in your hand and wrist. It was almost all of those bones laying in exactly the same order they would have been with, been in if the hand was still, you know, had all the skin and everything on it. And that was really exciting because that helps us learn um, first off, it looked super cool, but it also helped us learn a lot about what Homo naledi's hands, hands were like and how they could have been using these tools. Um, I noticed you had a Hogwarts shirt on, and I know that owls are a pretty big deal in Hogwarts, and we've actually found one or two owl bones in the Homo naledi in the Rising Star Cave, um, in addition to the hominin fossils that we find. So that's kind of a cool, fun thing. All right. Very cool and very observant as well. Uh, Mrs. Bidney's group, Canton, Michigan, fourth graders hanging out with us. Let's get that microphone turned on. How are we doing, Michigan? Yeah. Awesome. Who's up with the question? Stand up. Have you ever got stuck in a cave? The question is, have I ever gotten stuck in the cave? I myself have not gotten stuck in the cave. Um, but there are a few people that have gotten temporarily stuck in the cave, but we've been able to get them out. It's been um, pretty challenging and maybe a little bit embarrassing for them, but, um, but everybody's always been very safe and we've been able to get everybody out. All right. And uh, I believe there's even a section of one of the caves named after uh, the expedition leader, Lee Berger, who had a little squeeze in one of the caves one time. I let you say it so I didn't have to. All right, perfect. I know he loves that story. <laughs> All right, very cool. Well, uh, we're gonna go back to Thunder Bay. I, I can see Mrs. Uh, Levine's group's got their mic ready this time. So we're ready for you if you guys are. What inspired you to become a paleontologist? What inspired me to do the work that I'm doing? Um, well, when I went to graduate school, I was really interested in human history and humans. Where do we come from? What kind of stories that um, don't get to be put into our history books because we forgotten them or, or um, they never got written down. And I also like doing outdoor adventure stuff. Uh, so archeology span was a place that I could do that science. I could study history. I could find, um, I could help find stories that we'd forgotten. Uh, and then um, at the same time, this opportunity in Rising Star came up and they were looking for archeologists who had caving and climbing experience and um, who might fit in this cave and were up for a bit of an adventure. And uh, that was something that sort of fit the bill for me. So I applied and, and got invited to join the expedition. So my interest in, in history and in people and then also in um, being outdoors and doing, doing adventures, things like that. Yeah, very cool. So uh, we just mentioned the expedition lead, Lee Berger, and he actually put an ad on Facebook. I think you saw one of the ads on Facebook um, looking for people with experience like yourself, as well as a certain size uh, characteristic. So it's pretty awesome that this amazing team of women was able to come together uh, and just work in this amazing, challenging uh, 
atmosphere and bring up these amazing pieces for us to see. And I mean, right behind you, it's pretty amazing. Yeah, it's really fun to work that first group of us who were excavators were all women, like you said, and, and, you know, that's, that's really exciting to be in a group that um, is being led, you know, the, the hard work underground is being led by women. That's not to say that we don't have um, people of all genders on our team uh, working across in different areas, but so far all the excavators, all the people that have been underground with the toothpicks and paintbrushes, we've all been women. All right. Uh, let's see, let's go to Mrs. Breeze's group. They're hanging out with us in Canton, Michigan as well. So some good Michigan representation today. Let's get that microphone turned on. How are we doing, Michigan? Ah! All right, awesome. Who's up? Um, what is the oldest fossil you have found? What is the oldest fossil I myself have found? Um, the oldest one I found is this one here, this Homo naledi, and it's 300,000 years old. The oldest hominin fossil that's ever been found anywhere is, oh, six or seven million years old. And the ones in the other room, the first ones I showed you, those guys are two million years old. So some pretty old stuff. All right, so we're gonna take a quick visit to YouTube and snag a question from there. So, oh, I like this question, Becca. Um, this group here, uh, Miss Rybacki's class is wondering, uh, in your career, what's the first thing you found? What was your first find or your first, yeah, when you got out in the field? Wow, my first, the first thing I ever found doing archaeology. Wow. The first thing I found the first archaeology project I ever went on was in a place called the Great Dismal Swamp in Southern Virginia. And it is pretty much like it sounds. It's great and it's dismal and it's a swamp. Uh, and the first thing I found there was probably a teeny tiny fragment of a nail, um, which doesn't sound very exciting, but when you put it together with all the other things we found on that site, it helped us find, it helped us tell a really interesting story about the people who lived there. So sometimes it's the little tiny things that make a big impact, and sometimes it's the uh, it's the really like large pieces, like these bones, that make an impact. All right, very cool. We're gonna jump to Mrs. Murray's group. Uh, fourth graders hanging out with us. Let's get that microphone turned on. How are we doing, fourth graders? Hi. Hi. Okay. All right, we're ready. I have a question. Um, what are what are the other tools called? What are the other tools that you use called? You know, what kind of tools do we use when we do our work? So um, my favorite tool I use to excavate fossils is a porcupine quill, right off the porcupine. Um, they drop them and then we pick them up. We don't pull them off the porcupines, so that would be mean. Um, we use toothpicks and paintbrushes um, sometimes if we're doing archaeology on the surface, we'll use trowels, little, little shovels, but we don't use those with these bones because the bones are too delicate. And then we use lots of different technology like things like ground penetrating radar and um, 3D scanners that help us make models of the bones as we're excavating them. We'll use, um, we do a lot of mapping, drawing maps by hand and using laser uh, lasers to help us measure distances and put things on the map right in the right spot. Uh, so we use all kinds of different tools. We've even used a hair dryer underground in the cave because we were putting some fossils in plaster and the plaster wouldn't dry. So we brought a hair dryer to help dry them. So we use whatever's, whatever we can get our hands on. All right. So it's a job where you need a little flexibility and you got to think on your feet and make use of what you got. Very cool. Um, so we've got time. We're going to visit some of our classrooms for follow-ups. And Mrs. Sheffield's class just sent me a great question via the chat, but I think I want to let them ask it. So I'm going to turn their microphone on uh, if you guys want to ask that question, because it's a good one. As a female, do you feel you are treated like an equal in your field? Wow, the que that's a great question. The question is, as a woman, do I feel like I'm treated as an equal in my field? Um, 
Certainly when I'm working at the Rising Star Project, I do. We are a, a very collaborative and cooperative group that, you know, if you, if you have the right skills then, then, and you're doing a good job, then that's really all that matters. Um, but it's true that in, in parts of archaeology and paleoanthropology, there is some difference between how men and women are, have historically been treated and are still treated. But I think it's getting a whole lot better and a lot of people are working very hard to make sure that women are treated with as much respect as the men are and that everyone can, uh, can work together effectively. All right. I'm going to pop the microphone on uh, in Thunder Bay again because I can see someone waiting front and center. Uh, with a question. Oops, I missed it. Let me try that again. There we go. How many bones was there in the body that you found? How many bones were in the body that we found? Um, that's a tough question. Uh, so you can see behind me that the, the skeleton behind me is not complete, um, but it would have had the same number of bones that you and I have. It's just that some of the bones didn't, um, didn't fossilize, they didn't preserve, they decomposed, so we didn't find them. So that's why it maybe looks a little spotty and a little different. It would have had the same number of bones as we do. All together, we've found, uh, well, we found 1,500 fossils in the first couple seasons, and now we're up to like 2,000 or 2,500 bones all together. But that represents about 22 different individuals. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Yep. And then I've got a YouTube question coming in and they're wondering if you share the cave with any other inhabitants, are there any other creatures in the cave with you? Ah, there are bats in the rising star cave. Um, they generally leave us alone, but once in a while they'll do like a close flyby. And I think they're doing that on purpose because they can see us better than we can see them. Um, at the entrance to the cave, there are porcupines and these things called dusty. There are rock hyrax. Um, there's the occasional snake, and when those are at the entrance to the cave, we stay underground a little while longer till they move along. Um, and then on rare occasion, we'll see um, a couple of insects that are cave adapted. So they, um, they're, they don't have any coloring to them at all. They're these, these crazy little insects that really only live in caves. And we only see those, you know, we don't see those very often, but sometimes we do. All right. Let's take a swing through a few more classrooms and see if they have uh, a second question for us. So let's start with Mrs. Bidney's group. Do you guys have another question for us? Go ahead, Nora. How long have you been doing that? How long have I been doing, been doing this? The Rising Star Project started in 2013 and it's now almost 2020. So um, a little more than six years now. All um, right. Good question. Now, I'm just curious, Becca, when you started your career, it sounds like it was a little more towards structural uh, archeology. span Were you surprised that your career took this turn more towards um, human ancestors and such? Yes, I absolutely was surprised. This is the direction that, that my career has gone. Um, I didn't start off to study, uh, to study ancient, human, ancient human relatives like this. I was more interested in people who I lived in the past, but more recently, like 250 years ago or so. Um, but that shows that we need people with lots of different specialties on this project because I know a lot about excavation and about documentation and, and how to carefully excavate things that are delicate like these fossils. So whereas some of my colleagues are specialists in different parts of the body, I have a colleague who's, who knows everything there is to know about how the shoulder works of these fossils and, and of humans and of other animals. And so we need people that have different specialties to help us figure out as much as we can about, about, these, about these bones. I think that's one of the best things about science too, is there is no right or wrong way to get into science. There's all kinds of different paths. You may start studying one thing, find and fall into something else and find it's, it's your life's passion, your life's work. So I think that's one of the awesome things about science. Yeah. Uh, Mrs. Hugs Group in Guelph, your mic's on if you guys have another question. Okay, we've got one more coming. Perfect. How long have you been working? How long have you been working for? All right, so it sounds like she's curious about how long you've been working in total. How long have I been working in total? Oh, uh, I don't know. Um, <laughs> 
I started working. I, I had my first, one of my first jobs when I was in college, one of my first jobs that wasn't babysitting or something like that when I was in college. And that was a really long time ago, um, 24 years ago or so when I finished college anyway. So um, yeah, I've been working for a long time and I haven't always done archeology. span um, When I finished, when I finished uh, university, I actually went off and led wilderness expeditions and taught sixth grade science camps and, and things like that for a really long time, um, especially leading the leading expeditions um, right before I went back to school to study archeology. span So when I was in my uh, late thirties, I, I've had a change of career. Um, and I took everything that I had been doing before and applied it to this new field and continued to learn and continued to study. All right. Very cool. Again, another example of that twisting path that you can start off with one thing and you never know where you're going to end up. And to be curious, I think that's the most important thing. Be curious, try new things, uh, and you never know. Uh, let's see, Ms. Mickles group, I don't think we've been a second time. Your microphone is on. I just love that. Go ahead. The temperature, what are the usual temperatures in the caves? Can you hear? I didn't hear. Yeah, uh, Becca, he was asking about the temperatures in the cave. Ah, the temperatures in the cave. Um, the temperatures in the cave, it's 99% humidity. Uh, so it's really, it's really damp in there, which makes the low temperatures, which are, what is that, 18C, um, 68, 70 degrees. Um, feel feel really warm because even though it's sort of cool with all that humidity it feels quite warm so if you see the pictures of us you'll see us going underground in long sleeve and long pants um, so that we don't get scratched up as we go through the cave and then when we get to the cave we peel off our long sleeves so we're working in tank tops or short sleeves all right mrs breeze's class do you guys have one more question for us um have you ever found any animal bones in the in the cave? Have we ever found any animal bones in the cave? Well, first of all, I'd like to say that humans and our ancient relatives are animals, so we find lots of animal bones. But in terms of non-human animals, um, I mentioned those couple of owl bones earlier, and uh, there's a couple of teeth from a rodent of some sort. And that's about it, which is really surprising because when we look at other fossil hominin sites, other sites where we find similar kinds of bones that aren't these, we do find other animals. But deep, deep 30 meters underground through all that twisting and turning in the cave, really the only thing we're finding are these fossil hominins, which is crazy. All right. And Mrs. Murray's class, we're going to turn your mic on. I see someone waiting patiently. Okay, can you that's you? How do you handle the bones after you dig them out? That's a great question. How do we handle the bones after we dig them out? The first thing we do is we wrap them in some bubble wrap and we put them in, we put them in a plastic bag, we wrap them in bubble wrap, we put them in a Tupperware container, a little plastic box, just like your leftovers or your lunch might go in. We put the lid on, we wrap it in bubble wrap again, and we put it in a special bag and carry it carefully, carefully out of the cave. And then once it's on the surface, we let them dry very slowly, and then we'll clean them carefully with, with brushes. And sometimes we have to add some chemicals to help stabilize the bones, um, but sometimes we can just, just clean them and study them just like that. All Over right. Here. Those are the key. Very cool. So Becca, I wanna grab one more question off YouTube before we wrap up for today. And this group might be thinking about um, the swamp you worked in originally, or maybe just underwater archaeology uh, in general, but have, do you have any experience uh, with underwater archaeology and uh, any techniques that you know of to find something underwater? Obviously, it's a little, probably a little trickier than finding something on land. Yeah, I, um, I actually don't do anything really underwater. The stuff we do in the swamp is, um, it's not properly underwater. Sometimes it's on dry spots within the swamp. Um, and I have a lot of respect for people who do underwater archaeology. I don't particularly enjoy scuba diving, um, but you have to be able to be a good scuba diver and enjoy being underwater and then have enough, um, enough wherewithal to be doing the science underwater too, to be doing all that excavating while there's crazy fish swimming by you and while you're, while you're remembering to breathe through your, 
through your regulator and all of that. Um, that's all a little too much for me. <laughs> all right. Well, don't sell yourself short because a lot of people wouldn't want to go underground into those tight spaces. So um, to each their own, I guess. Exactly. Exactly. All right. Very cool. Well, uh, first of all, I want to give a huge thanks to our YouTube group. Thank you so much for joining in. Thanks for sending in those awesome questions. Uh, big shout out to our live camera classroom. You guys are awesome as always. Thanks for hanging out with us this morning and uh, asking those great questions. And Becca, we love our monthly visits to the museum. Thank you so much uh, for giving us uh, the tour, teaching us a little bit about one of our ancestors. And we look forward to joining you again uh, in January. Yay, thanks. All right. Well, the last thing I'm going to do, boys and girls, I'm going to turn all the microphones on. Let's get nice and loud. A big goodbye and thank you uh, for Becca. Here we go. <laughs> Good job, boys and girls. You never let us down when it comes to that part. Thank you so much. Uh, Becca, once again, thank you. Thank you to the Pearl Museum. We love uh, our visits and we will talk to everybody there soon. Great. Thank you very much.